Tonight on DC News Now, capping restaurant fees, how the DC Council is looking to minimize extra costs when eating out. And a Maryland family demanding justice. No family should have to endure such heartbreak, such injustice. What they're saying about a deadly shooting that killed their cousin. Plus, police in Hagerstown getting additional help, how drones are assisting officers. And some court settlements to look out for this month. We're putting more money back into your pocket. A new report detailing the loneliest cities in America, where the DMV falls on that list and what you can do moving forward. You're watching the station covering all of the DMV. This is DC News Now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for DC News Now at 6 o'clock. I'm Chris Flanagan. And I'm Annalisa Gale. We do want to warn you that the video you are about to see can be disturbing to watch. Now, the family of a Maryland man spoke out after he was shot and killed by Prince George's County Police last month. Yeah, that man was 31-year-old Melvin J. It happened inside a Suitland apartment last month when Prince George's County Police responded for a break-in. DC News Now's Yamari Sase was at the press conference today where his family called for a full investigation. Yeah, the family of Melvin J says he was a loving father, brother, and friend, and they believe the officer's actions were not justified, and they plan on filing a civil lawsuit. Melvin J was one of those persons who just had an aura of positive vibes around him. He loved his family dearly. A month later, and the family of 31-year-old Melvin J is still trying to wrap their head around what happened. The pain we feel is immeasurable. And the questions swirling in our minds are endless. Our grief is raw, our anger is justified, and our resolve is unwavering. On Monday, police released this body camera footage. Show me your hands. Show me your hands. Bring your ass over here. Show me your hands. The video shows seconds before Officer Braxton Shelton fired his weapon, killing Jay. Police say Officer Shelton was responding to the apartment for a report of a break in. We later learned that Jay did live in the home. In the recorded statement, Police Chief Malik Aziz says the leaseholder who called 911 did not inform the dispatcher that he knew two people, including Jay, were inside the home. Officials say a gun was recovered inside Jay's pocket and another by the sink. No matter the circumstances, he did not have to die. We're always told, think before you act and react so you won't regret your decision or make a decision that cannot be repaired. That rule should not be an exception just because you're wearing a uniform or a badge. Now the family plans to file a civil lawsuit in hopes to get justice. We will honor Melvin's memory by seeking justice and by striving to create a world where tragedies like this never happen again. Uh, justice for Melvin. Now, the officer involved, Braxton Shelton, was placed on paid leave since the incident, and we did reach out to PGPD for comment. They refer this back to the Maryland Attorney General's office, and they did not get back to us just yet. For now, reporting in Oxon Hill, Maryland, I'm Yamari Sase, DC News Now. Yamari, yeah, thank you. All right, Chief Peter Alt, Janessa Webb here, and uh, Janessa, kind of a... I guess a yucky day is the best way to say it, right? Yeah, hopefully, it. yeah, hopefully you weren't caught off guard, you know, with the no. rain. No, you, you told we you warned us. To you, Janessa. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> Very good. Uh, tomorrow's going to be a lot better, so oh, not going to see all this kind of dreary conditions. Uh, the rain going to pull out by tomorrow morning. So excited for that. There's still increasing clouds, but let's take a look at what's happening. Uh, it's a light drizzle across uh, the region that you're seeing this live shot right now, and actually visibility is starting to go down with the cold front to our west out towards Hagerstown uh, at this hour. And so that's going to continue to filter through and so provide us with another swath of rain. Really, this does not end until about 11 o'clock tonight. So just be aware for your dinner plans. We're going to continue to watch this rain filtering in from Culpeper, Warrington, Manassas up towards the D.C. metro area with our next wave uh, really coming in from the Richmond area. This is providing a light to scattered rainfall at this point. All that severe and the heavy duty stuff is now now up towards Philly and New York City. So we've kind of got through the worst of it, but light drizzle going to continue to uh, really impact the region. Winds, they have now shifted out of the north and west, and that's why you're seeing a little bit of cooler air across the region. But here's our visibility concern down to four miles in front of you out towards Woodstock as well. And as the front continues to track in from west to east, uh, visibility going to go down for the metro area as well. Tonight, your evening planner will keep uh, rain showers in the 
forecast, but still very mild. Folks, we're going to go on a two day stretch of dry conditions. One has a lot of sunshine. I'll show you a day coming up, guys. OK, Janessa, we'll see you then. Thanks. Meanwhile, detectives in Prince George's County releasing this surveillance video here. It shows two suspects wanted for sexually assaulting a woman earlier this week in Hyattsville. They followed the victim as she walked along Ager Road on Monday. Police say they grabbed her and sexually assaulted her at knife point in the woods. Anyone with information is now urged to call Prince George's County Police. And right now, D.C. police say they have arrested a third person in the death of a 10 year old girl on Mother's Day last year. Ariana Davis was riding home with her family when bullets struck their car, killing her last year. Earlier today, police charged 24 year old Charles Edward Owen with first degree murder while armed. He was already in custody at a D.C. jail. Two 19 year old men were previously arrested and charged in her death as well. Well, in Virginia, Stafford County police say they've cracked two cold case murders after 30 years. 32 year old Jacqueline Lard went missing after work in 1989. Two days later, her body was found in the woods. Three years after that, 18 year old Amy Baker went missing after visiting family in Fairfax County. Investigators believe she would run out of gas on I-95 and was strangled to death while walking to a gas station. Police say DNA evidence from crime scenes and genealogy sequencing pointed to now 65 year old Elroy Harrison. He was arrested at his home yesterday and is now being held at the Rappahannock Regional Jail without bond. Well, tens of thousands in Fairfax County have gone without their usual rides to work for two weeks now, but there's hope on the horizon. Hopefully drivers and mechanics for the Fairfax Connector bus service have been on strike over pay and retirement benefits. Fairfax Connector workers are set to vote on an agreement reached by union representatives and bus service operator Transdev. The agreement comes after hours of negotiations yesterday. Now the majority of the Connectors union members must agree. Local lawmakers are pressuring Transdev to return to service. 26,000 people rely on this bus service daily and many riders are paying for ride shares and rails. Instead, a vote could come this evening. Well, developing tonight, 26 volunteers with DC's Humane Rescue Alliance say they were terminated yesterday and tonight their volunteer advocacy group is searching for some answers. Yeah, and some of them say it's retaliation for speaking out against HRA's practices and policies. DC News Now's Randy Bass has been digging into these allegations and joins us with arguments from both sides of this issue. Yeah, and one of those now former volunteers tells us she got an email out of the blue around noon yesterday from HRA letting her know her work would no longer be needed after two and a half years of volunteering and fostering cats. I'll cry just thinking about it. Like, it's heartbreaking because the only reason I do it is to help the animals. I Alyssa Sillers of Northeast D.C. Cats. says she's helped to foster and care for dozens of cats through HRA, including Florida. Sillers says the cat was malnourished and pregnant when a neighbor tried to get her into HRA's care in January. The staff at HRA, the front desk staff where the neighbor actually took her, had said, oh, well, if you leave her here, she'll be euthanized. Sillers says she took Florida and her three newborn kittens into her care. She says she recently submitted public testimony critical of HRA to the D.C. Council and the several weeks it took the Alliance to agree to help Florida and the kittens. Those cats still in her care as of today. Do they even have a, a care for the cat's life? I mean, you're terminating my agreement with you while you, I still have a mom and her three kittens. Other volunteers who were let go also raising red flags about HRA's euthanasia policies and practices. Between April and September of 2023, volunteers with access to that data say HRA euthanized 126 of the 847 kittens it took in, about 15% of them. That's compared to just 6% in 2022 and 5% of kittens at HRA in 2021. Yeah, as for the allegations of use of euthanasia at HRA, we asked for comment earlier this morning. We have not yet received a direct response to that question. In the newsroom, I'm Randy Bass, DC News Now. All right, the cherry blossoms are officially in stage two. The National Park Service making that announcement yesterday. In this new video from today, if you look closely, you can see buds visible on the trees. Now, there are still four more stages before peak bloom, which NPS predicts will be between March 23rd and March 26 so we are getting there well all new tonight climbing to new heights some of the best climbers in the country are in gaithersburg right now dc news now kevin dupree who covers montgomery county for us shows us how they are competing for a spot on team usa 
climbers from across the country are here at Sport Rock in Gaithersburg to compete for a chance to become a member of the USA Climbing National Team. Competitive rock climbing, a sport of endurance, balance, and strength. Those skills put to the test at today's lead semifinals. It was all very awkward, like nothing felt comfortable, so you never really got a chance to like think about what was happening, or maybe you had too much time to think about what was happening. The wall was a challenge for many climbers, but some were able to conquer it. I'm in first right now. I don't want to jinx anything, but I'm, I'm very happy and confident in how I did. Um, so I'm just super, super, super excited. Climbers say they embrace the competition, but the thing they enjoy most is meeting fellow competitors and cheering them on. To have everybody like kind of welcome you into this space and be psyched on like what you're doing regardless of your level. Like as long as you're trying hard and you're interested and you're excited, like people will be psyched on that. And USA Climbing National Team head coach Joshua Larson agrees. He says the character of people in the competitive rock climbing community is what makes the sport so special. You can go anywhere in the world and you can find a climbing gym, you can find a climbing partner, you can find a friend. I think that's the coolest part about climbing. The USA Climbing National Team Trials event will go until March 10th. Reporting in Gaithersburg, I'm Kevon Dupree, DC News Now.